what I feel in this place is unbelievable. I feel unity. God have mercy. Yeah. was unity in the upper room yeah. when the Holy Ghost fell. You hear that rain? Yeah. I just want to say, open the floodgates of heaven yeah. and let it rain. Let it rain. It, 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 it is, I was last night just praying, and I went to the church at almost 7 o'clock last night and prayed, and I felt in my spirit, but I just needed to tell you this. You, you know, you hear a lot of preachers come through the door and they'll tell you, that, listen, this is what they'll say, you're on the precipice. You ever heard that? Or you're standing at the threshold. Y'all ain't at no threshold. Come on. Come on, hear it. You've already walked through the door. <laughs> I feel that so strong in the Holy Ghost right now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I may not even get to preach. I don't know. You ain't at the precipice. You've went through the door. God said, I opened it, to, and you went through it. And you know, if, if I could get, if, if this man could get about three men, if, you could, if there was about three men that would just get a burden to teach Bible studies, you'd have that 100-soul revival before June of next year. You say, that's only seven months, seven and a half, eight months away. That don't matter. That's right. It was 3,000 in one day on the day of Pentecost. Yeah. <laughs> Two chapters later, it was five more thousand. God, God is in the business of addition and multiplication. That's right. He's not in the business of, of, more of, of dividing and subtraction. That's the devil's job. But you step through God's door, and he said, I'm here to add and multiply. God have mercy. I feel, man, if you could feel what I feel right up here. Yes, sir. I got to preach. Just let me preach. But I, I just want to tell you, you ain't at the threshold anymore. Just about three or four weeks ago, you walked through the door that God said to do. And, it, and I feel unity, and I feel such liberty and peace in this house. Never before have I felt what I feel right now. Amen. And how many times have I preached here? Several. And I've always had liberty to preach, but I feel something in the Holy Ghost right now. This ain't going to be just a singular cultural church. Come on, this is going to be a multicultural revival. God is... Man, I'm not just up here with hyperbole. I'm telling you what I feel in the Holy Ghost right now. This isn't just to prime you up. If you don't say anything about what I'm saying, this is what I feel. Yeah. I'm not a prophet, but I do pray, and I know what I feel in prayer. Yes. And the Holy Ghost is about to just poof. You probably should have built this building twice as big as what it is right now. How many kids walked out of here a minute ago? It looked like it looked like a herd, man, that walked out of this place. And it still looks pretty full in here.
And I preach to both churches, and I see faces from both places, but I see people that I've never seen before. A specific place he's not bound by a specific man he is limitless when we take him out of the of the box that we try to put him in he's limitless he knows no limits he, he, he doesn't matter come on it doesn't matter how what we think the Bible says unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above that which we ask or think according according to the power that worketh in us there's something at work in us today come on there's a vision of a man of god that's at work in this body and god is about to blow this thing open I have no idea why I'm preaching what I'm about to preach. I've struggled with it. I've, I've prayer last, man, it was last weekend. And God put this in my spirit. I was like, God, why? I don't know why. I don't have the answers. All I do is just obey what I feel in the Holy Ghost. And it ain't because I'm preaching. I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm anything. Man, if you want somebody that's something, you call my pastor, and he's the man, and I give honor to him, and I give honor to your pastor today. And I appreciate men of God in my life. I give honor to my bishop. And those men are something. I'm nothing, but I'm going to tell you right now what I feel in the Holy Ghost. This message is going to take this church and again it ain't it's it ain't because i'm preaching it it's just because it's the word of god it's going to take this church to the next <laughs> this is a preparation message for what god is about to do in this place because this church is now positioned itself for reputation I don't preach like this very often. I don't say stuff like this very often, but I'm just feeling something. Won't you stand with me for the reading of the word of the Lord and just stick your finger over in 1 Chronicles, the 27th chapter. And then turn, and where I'm going to start is in Ecclesiastes, the 10th chapter, in the first verse, and I'm going to read it. One verse of scripture out of Ecclesiastes and one verse of scripture out of First Chronicles 27. Solomon is writing in Ecclesiastes. If anybody knew anything about temple worship, it had to be Solomon. This dude knew what it was like when he was right to have church. When the queen, a matter of fact, when the queen of Sheba came and she saw everything that Solomon was doing, the one thing that really sticks out in my spirit is she saw his ascent by which he went up to the house of the Lord. That tells me, elder, that he made a big deal out of going to church. And when she saw everything, her spirit, she fainted. There was no spirit left in her. She couldn't. Let me tell you, when, when people walk off the street and they walk into an apostolic church and the glory of God moves,
Ecclesiastes 10, 1. Dead flies <laughs> cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. First Chronicles 27, 28, and over the olive trees and the sycamore trees that were in the low places was Baal Hanan, the Gedarite. And over the cellars of oil was Joash. Father, we bless you today. Thank you for your word. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. God, anoint my lips to preach. God, help me to walk in the Holy Ghost. Let me say what you desire and nothing less and nothing more. God, anoint this congregation for the, for the reputation that you've put this church. God. <laughs> What you desire this church to be, God, give them the anointing to receive it today. Help us to receive your word. Anoint us to do the task at hand. For this is where revival happens. I praise you, God, for your goodness. Why don't you put your Bibles down right now and give God a massive hand clap of praise. This is probably, in my opinion, one of the strangest scriptures in the whole Bible. Dead flies. I don't know if you, I don't know if you care for flies that much. I will throw a whole sandwich away if a fly lands on my sandwich. I ain't eating it. You say, well, you're just crazy. I, Say what you I've seen what they laid on my food. Come on, somebody. Y'all laughing, but I'm 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 being serious. Because there's certain things that I just don't want inside of me. And when Solomon wrote this, he understood there was probably literally nobody maybe outside of Moses and Aaron that knew what it was like to have church like Solomon knew how to have church. You know why? Because he had watched it. He had watched his father David. David brought the Ark of the Covenant back from Obed-Edom's house and every six paces would stop and sacrifice and David would dance before the Lord. Six paces, every six paces. Worship meant something. <clears throat> and Solomon had watched all of David's preparation for the temple. It was in David's heart to do such. It was in his heart to be the one that would build the temple. But for the reason that David was a man of blood and war and he had shed so much blood, God said, I'm not going to let you build it, but your son Solomon's going to build the temple. And David was in preparation. This stuff didn't just, Solomon did, 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 didn't just send everybody out to do this. Uh, there was stuff in store waiting on him uh, when he stepped up to take the position of king. David had prepped for a long time. And Solomon had seen him uh, place men in charge of certain things. The book, of, the book of Chronicles where we read chapter 27, it goes through a laundry list of men that David appointed over things that would be pertaining to the house of God that Solomon would build. Let me preach for a I'm, I'm, I'll preach, just bear with me. 
Look at it. And uh, the scripture that we read uh, in 1 Chronicles, the 27th chapter, 28th verse, it just says one little snippet about this man and nothing else is mentioned about him ever that I can find. And over the cellars of oil was Joash. He had one job because they had found out that this oil was precious, but it could get spoiled. Yes, sir. Yeah. Hence the reason Solomon in Ecclesiastes, the 10th chapter, wrote, Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. Flies would blow and they would get in and they would land in the oil and if the oil was unattended and the flies would die, it would cause that which was holy to begin to stench. Help me, Holy Ghost. And this oil was never meant to have a foul odor. As a matter of fact, in the book of Exodus, the 30th chapter, you can find that it was made of principal spices. And it was made according to the 30th chapter of Exodus after the art of the apothecary. The apothecary was the perfumer. He was the one that made everything that smelled sweet. He made the frankincense that they would burn before the veil of the temple when they would come out of that place of death. They had walked past the brazen altar and they had sacrificed and the smell and the stench of death was upon them and they would walk into the holy place and before they would go into the presence of God, they would burn this incense and all of a sudden that which was dead and the stench of death that was in their nostrils would be alleviated by the presence of that incense that the apothecary made and the perfumer and that sweet smell. You ever heard elders? I don't hear it said very much in my generation, but the other night in church, I heard an old elder get up and Brother Davis, he began to talk about the sweet Holy Ghost. I'm telling you today, uh, there is still something uh, that is very sweet uh, about the presence of God. Uh, it, br it brings uh, the stench of death uh, to nothing uh, when I get in the presence of God uh, and I begin to feel his glory uh, and I begin to smell uh, the sweet savor of heaven. Uh, there's still something sweet uh, about being filled uh, with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. Dead flies. Little things get in there. Joash, you've got a job today. Solomon understood. We can't let it get ruined because this, this oil was used very specifically according to Exodus, the 30th chapter. Verse 22 is where it starts and it reads down and he talks about the principal spices that were in it and everything that was in it smelled beautiful. There was calamus and there was sweet cinnamon and man, I don't know about this time of year, all the way through Christmas time, and you begin, to, people begin to cook, and they cook with, there's nothing in this world that smells better than an apple pie cooked with cinnamon, and you can smell that smell going through your house. And brother, that, that oil, when it was poured on the stuff in the sanctuary, 
Oh, hallelujah. When you come out of that stench of death, uh, out of sacrifice and uh, off of that brazen altar and uh, off of all that, uh, all that death and that blood uh, that was on the outside of that tabernacle and you walk in there where the priest uh, had poured this oil on the, on the table of shoe bread uh, and they had, he had poured the oil on the candlestick uh, and on the table of incense uh, and it was poured uh, on the Ark of the Covenant uh, and all of a sudden you walk in uh, to the presence of God uh, and the stench is gone uh, because the perfumer had been there uh, and Joash uh, had done his job uh, and he had kept the flies uh, out of that oil uh, and the little things uh, that hinder the anointing. Uh, it was kept out uh, and it was sweet uh, when they walked in uh, to the presence of God. I'm telling you today, uh, I don't have time uh, to let little things uh, get in my spirit uh, and hold me back uh, from God's presence. Sweet. Hallelujah. I don't have time. Come on to let little things get in me. Flies are little bitty creatures. Man, they're tiny. Oh, but I'm telling you, when you get enough of them, that they've been on before, it'll begin to cause everything uh, to have stench about it. Uh, they, uh, Solomon said it, uh, dead flies. Uh, it causes the ointment uh, of the perfumer to send forth uh, a stinking savor. God never meant for his church uh, to be gathered into a place uh, and our bad attitudes uh, cause the anointing to... Because this church uh, is in reputation now. God's pulled you through the door, and you've got, come on, uh, come on. God's put you in a position uh, of reputation uh, in this community, uh, and you can't afford uh, to let something get in your oil. You've got to have uh, the spirit of Joash uh, and keep uh, the sellers of oil. God set so many principles in this, man. It blows my mind how multidimensional the Word of God is. But it all leads to one God and one plan. But the, come on, but the tentacles reach out in so many different directions trying to pull people and draw people and I can preach one thing one way and it come on and he can come again come with the same scripture and go with a different thought and the tentacles can reach here where it didn't reach here before and then re come on come on it's multidimensional but it leads to there is only one God and there is one plan of salvation come on hey hallelujah Exodus 30, 26 through 29, the Bible says that every bit of the tabernacle was anointed uh, with the oil of the apothecary. There was oil that lit the lamps. Uh, it was different. It was just pure olive oil. But what anointed uh, all of that tabernacle was that which smelled precious. Uh, and come on, uh, I'm telling you right now, uh, oh, hallelujah, when I walk into a church, uh, I don't want to feel bad spirits. Uh, when I walk into the house of God, come on, uh, I want it to be the friendliest place uh, I can walk into. Uh, because after all, we've got the greatest message. Uh, we've got the great God of heaven. We've got what this world needs to bring them out of darkness, and we can't afford to let the oil stink. Oh, God. Then God says something weird in Exodus chapter 30 concerning the oil. He said, 
He said it can't be put on man's flesh. And when I read that, I'm like, wait a minute, God. Because you just said two verses earlier that it was to be poured upon Aaron and his sons and anoint them. But it can't be put upon flesh. And God give me revelation of this scripture because it was a type of the Holy Ghost. It was a type of the outpouring of the Spirit of God. Let me preach for a minute. Hallelujah. It was a type of New Testament salvation when the Holy Ghost would be poured out. But it wasn't supposed to be poured out upon man's flesh. But he said in the book of Romans, in the 8th chapter, in the ninth verse, but ye are not in the flesh. Oh, hallelujah. But in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Uh, come on, God made a way uh, for it to be poured upon me. Uh, he made a way uh, when he said, you're not in the flesh, uh, but you're in the spirit. Uh, if so be uh, that God's spirit uh, dwell uh, in you. <laughs> See, God made outs for everything in the Old yeah. Testament. Because it was all a type of what was going to happen later on. You're preaching. It's just like with Melchizedek and Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ had no right to be a high priest. He was born to the wrong tribe. He should have been a Levite, but he came out of Judah, and Judah was the king. Oh, come on. And that's where we get him to be the king of kings. But by the law, he had no right to be the high priest. But God said, I'm going to make a way where there seems to be no way. I'm going to make a way, Abraham, when you come back from the slaughter of the kings. You're going to meet a man by the name of Melchizedek, and I'm going to make my Christ a priest after the order of Melchizedek. I'm going to be a theophany. I'm going to step down out of glory and make a way for my Christ to be everything that you need for salvation. said, yeah, it can't be poured upon flesh, but you're not in the flesh. Right. Yeah. If the Spirit of God dwell in you. Come on, I don't walk in the flesh. I don't obey the lust of the flesh. You want to know why? Because I got something that's in me. And John said it like this. Greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. That's why I can't allow little things to get down in my spirit. That's why I can't dwell in what happened yesterday or last week or last year or some of you dealing with junk that's 10 years ago and you hadn't overcome it because you've let bitterness come on, get down in your... You can't afford to have bitterness in your spirit uh, when you've been redeemed uh, by this great gospel. Right. I can't let that spirit get down in me, man. That's right. You don't understand how wrong I've been done. You don't understand how wrong Jesus was done. Come on. That's right. You don't understand how they treated me. You ever read the story of Joseph? Let me preach for a minute. Right, preach. Let me tell you about the power of the story of Joseph. God hung the salvation of humanity on one man's ability to forgive somebody. Yeah. Come on, unforgiveness will cause your oil to stink. Yeah. Let me preach for a minute. What are you talking about? How? How did God put that on one man's ability to forgive? Because Joseph, when he come out of that prison cell, he was exalted to the second position in the nation of Egypt. Yeah. Watch this. He was only second when Pharaoh was sitting on the throne. Pharaoh said, only in my throne will I be greater than you when I'm in the throne. When I'm out of the throne, everything goes through you, Joseph. And those 11 brothers came traipsing down to Egypt. Sorry, that's my Tennessee roots coming out using the word traipse. I don't even know what it means. 
sounds good. Praise God. They came strolling down to Egypt because there was famine in Canaan. And Joseph seen them coming from afar off, man. And he had the power of life and death. He would have been justified. Oh, you didn't hear what I said. Anybody in this world would have said Joseph would have been justified if he would have just said, off with their head. They put me in slavery. I'm preaching to somebody right now. They sold me in slavery. They put me in this place where I got falsely accused. Anybody been there? They put me in a place where that false accusation put me in a prison. I don't know how long he was there before he interpreted the baker and the butler's dream, but I know he was there two years afterwards. Because you put me in a place, boys, that I got forgotten. Have mercy. You see, his oil could have been yes. tainted while he was down there in that cellar. Wouldn't he? Yes. he could have let the oil get stuff down in it. He could have allowed bitterness to brew in his heart. I've been done wrong. Man, it's easy to justify. Come on. Bitterness when I've been done wrong. It's easy to hold unforgiveness when you just don't know. But God took the salvation of humanity and placed it on the shoulders of one man. And he said, if you fail me, While he was in that cellar, I'll, I'll use cell, he was in the king's prison, in the pit. I'm going to let God be God in my life, and I'm going to let, you let the tongues wag, and you let the, you let the junk come, and you let the... Screaming out from a... From his ass teeth, and he said, I look for God and I can't find him. I, I don't know where he's at, but I'm. But the Bible says that the Lord blessed Job when he, he turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for who? looking at Job boils all over his body scraping him with broken pottery and then at the end of seven days 30 accused him of, of sin and falsely accused him of, of, of a bad reputation uh, and here they are sitting there playing the blame game. Job, God doesn't do this to people who are righteous. There's hidden sin in your life. But God, but God, but God turned the... friends. I've got a community. They've talked bad about my church, but I'm still going to go preach to them. I'm still going to love them. I'm still going to reach out to them because one day
going to come on. Uh, there's been people that's died for this message, uh, and you want to quit uh, when you've been... them out. Uh, bitterness, uh, unforgiveness, uh, hatred, uh, variance, emulation. I'm going to get it all out uh, because there's revival in Maysville, Kentucky. Solomon. Man, I got to hurry. God charged you, Joash. You better be a keeper of the oil. Because my house is a house of sacrifice. It's a house of sacrifice. I'm fixing to preach now. I I, this was just the warm up, just getting off the run. This is a house of sacrifice. I got to get stuff out of me. Because when I get the stuff out of me, man, it's going to be a place where the glory falls. It was Solomon, man. Solomon knew what it was when he built that temple, what it was like to sacrifice. 22,000 oxen, 120,000 sheep he slaughtered them when he dedicated that building. That's 220,000 gallons of blood of oxen. And it's 480,000 gallons of of the blood of sheep hallelujah and he was doing it all to point me to the place where 10 pints of blood was going to be shed on calvary and it come on and that 10 pints of blood was enough to annihilate every sin from adam to the last man born oh hallelujah and he said i my house is going to be a place of sacrifice and i can't allow there to be stench on everything that's been sanctified in the house you've got to keep the oil Joe Ash you've got to get down in the cellar and pull things out that are hindering you from the move of God in your life because this is a house of sacrifice and every piece of furniture that's in this house is a type of that sacrifice so he said when you offer which is what I want you to do when you offer Can I preach all right? This is okay. Can I preach for just about 10 more minutes? He said, when you offer, there has to be sacrifice made. And there's got to be certain things that you put with this sacrifice. There's some things that you can't offer sacrifice without in your life. First of all, he said, every oblation that you offer has got to be offered with salt. You want me to read it to you? Leviticus 2.13 In every oblation of thy meat offering shalt thou season with salt. Neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of, the, of thy God to be lacking from thy meat offering. Then he says, with all thine offering thou shalt offer salt. Because this is the house of sacrifice. And then he took it into the New Testament. <laughs> yeah, you own it. Then he brought it into the New Testament. And Elder, he said, Ye are the salt of the earth. Because this is the house of sacrifice bring salt into the house when you offer sacrifice because salt does some stuff with that sacrifice baby I love country ham and I'll come on and the saltier it is the better I like it because come on you you hang that ham out in that smokehouse it can be just open and it's just in there and I've never seen a fly get on the get on the country ham because it's too salty for it to get on hallelujah come on hallelujah that
And when I'm salty, uh, when I've got the salt down in me, hallelujah, those flies tend to keep their self off of me uh, because it dehydrates them uh, and puts them to death. I've seen mold grow on them. I've seen mold get that thick on a country ham, uh, but I've never seen a fly get on one when I walked out to the smokehouse uh, in the middle of the summer to pull one out to bring it in to eat, uh, and we just wipe the mold off, uh, slice it, and fry it. Uh, hallelujah. And it's not been tainted uh, because it's been salted down. Uh, oh, I'm telling you right now, uh, praise God, uh, you've got to get salt in you. Uh, you are the salt uh, of the earth, uh, and you can't allow things to mix with you uh, and take the salt out. It doesn't matter if it's a thousand degrees. Uh, salt is still salt. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's in the North Pole uh, and it's minus 50 degrees. Uh, salt uh, is still salt. Uh, and the only way uh, to make salt not salt uh, is to mingle it uh, with something, some kind of outside calm. can't mingle in my spirit. You better hear what I'm preaching to you right now. I can't allow the world. I can influence the world, but I can't allow the world to influence me. That's, right. that's why I stay in a prayer room. That's right. That's why, I st that's why when I get up at 5, 5.30 in the morning uh, and I go down and I sit in my recliner with a cup of coffee, this is what I take. Come on. Uh, I'm telling you right now. I, come on. Uh, this is where I get salt down in me. Uh, this is where I get it. Uh, this is my supply. Uh, and as long as I've got it, uh, that's what I quoted earlier in prayer. Thy word uh, have I hid in my heart uh, that I might not sin uh, Against the you got to get the salt in you because every time you offer, you've got to offer it with salt. Can I preach? Good, good. Salt makes you thirsty. Yes, sir. Country ham is sweet tea. Is gonna be this much in the spirit, did you? <laughs> and the more I the more I eat of it, the thirstier I get. And the saltier you are, the thirstier people will get that are around you for what you've got on the inside of you. Yes. Yes. Salt is an infection killer. You know how you keep infection out of your mouth when you get a tooth pulled? You gargle salt water. Because the salt will kill the infection. It don't feel good when you pour salt on an open wound, but it will keep it from getting infected. And if you've got salt in you, the infection of sin is not going to get down in you. It doesn't matter who cuts you open. Come on. It doesn't matter who hurts your spirit. It doesn't matter who wounds you. Because if you've got the salt, it'll never allow infection to set up in you. And you'll walk out healed every time. In Jesus' name, I'm telling you, I don't have time today to allow the thing of this world to influence me and my oil to begin to stink. Yeah. Salt is a preservative. Yeah. It'll keep you. That's how that ham stays in there for years. Yeah. See, the problem is, is, is this, is they got a new way of doing it now, and it don't work as good. They put, they make a Brian solution now, not a Brian, but a salt Brian. B R I N. Yes, thank you. And the problem with the Brian solution is this: is it waters it down.
And I watched a man do it one time, and he had hundreds of dollars worth of hams ruined because he didn't do it the way the old timer. telling you I feel this like I'm about to blow up. We don't need a new way. We don't need a new way. We don't need a new message. We don't need a new method. Hallelujah. It worked in Acts 2.38 and it's going to work in 2021. It is still repentance and baptism in Jesus' name and infilling of the Holy Ghost. Oh, hallelujah. He said, look for the old paths. Look for the old. Come on. If the old timers did it 50 years ago, I've still got to do it that way. It'll preserve you. It'll keep you. It'll keep you in the hour of temptation. It'll keep you when somebody hurts you. It'll keep you when the devil's fighting your mind. It'll preserve you. The Holy Ghost is salt today, and the Holy Ghost will keep you every day that you allow yourself to be led by the Spirit of God. kills things, man, because it's salt. It's a house of sacrifice. And when I offer, I've got to offer with the salt. And then he said in Leviticus 2, 1 and 2, <laughs> when you shall offer a meat offering unto the Lord, his offering shall be a fine flour, and he shall pour oil put frankincense there on because he wants it to smell good. Oil. Man, I, I can hear this story and I'm going to, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but when that man was on his way to Jericho in the New Testament, Jesus was telling the story. He said a priest, he said a priest came down and saw the man he had fell among the thieves and robbers and he was laying there half dead and broke and naked and all that stuff. And the priest just, yeah, I don't know much of that. Walked over to the other side of the road. Now we can't have that part of the ministry. Then a Levite came and yeah, I don't the ultimate rebuke to a Jew is just what this cometh to nails and that. You know, he was speaking of himself. They considered the Jews a half breed, or the Samaritans a half breed. They were racist people, folks. You can't allow that black man to have a white wife. the way they thought. Well, I, I, I'm about to plow something I don't need to plow, probably. Yeah. This, this Samaritan came down and he saw the man broken and beat and tattered and half dead and he said, do something about it. It's a picture of Jesus Christ. Jesus lived with a reputation. His mama lived with a reputation. Never been with a man, but how'd you have this boy? <laughs> Who's the real daddy? Half-breed. A Samaritan, if you will. Jesus was speaking of himself. He said, and the Samaritan came down the road. He had compassion on him. He said, he poured in his wound oil and wine. Any 
on his feet, took him to the inn, paid the innkeeper, and said, if I owe you any more money until he feels, feed him, keep him, I'll come back and I'll pay it off. God, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Because this is a house of sacrifice. And when I offer sacrifice, I've got to pour, pour the oil upon it. There's a song, and I don't, I don't know the, all the words to it, but it talks about, it says like oil upon my feet, like wine for me to drink. And I, I don't remember all the words to it. I wish I could think of them right now. But he said when you offer, you've got to offer oil. Oil is a type of the Holy Ghost. So is wine also a type of the Holy Ghost. And he told them, he said, listen, I was going to preach this different, but I feel, a, I feel something in the Holy Ghost right now. I've got to slow down a little bit. And I've got to take this oil, and it smells precious. And I've got to pour in wine, because wine was a healing agent. And these people that you reach this weekend, those 170 that you reach by outreach, They need somebody to heal them. That's what this place is about. If you will, it's the end. It's the place where the Samaritan took the man and he laid him down and he said, this is where you're going to find your healing. You're a keeper of the oil. God didn't charge you to keep anybody else's oil. He charged you to keep yours. It's the pastor's job to take care of problems, not you. Poured in their oil and come on, I want the music to come. I feel like this thing. I feel like we just need that. He said, You've got to offer your oblation with oil. You've got to come before me and you've got to pour that oil out. It reminds me of the extravagant worship of Mary. <laughs> when Mary came to Jesus and she had an alabaster box. The Bible says it was a year's wages. It was so valuable. And she broke that box. She poured it on to the Lamb of God. Watch this. I want you to hear this. And the disciples rebuked her. And said, what, what meaneth this waste? Judas, you really think it's waste? And Jesus said, leave her alone because she's done it unto my burial. And the fragrance lingered. And at the whipping post, while that Roman soldier was beating the back of Jesus Christ, in the midst of In the midst of that pain and that suffering, I can smell the fragrance of what that woman did. Because somebody kept the oil fresh. When they planted that crown of thorns and they beat it down onto his brow in the pain and the soft suffering. Somebody cared enough about me to pour the oil on me. (laughs) 
looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. I think the endurance was probably helped along every time somebody would do something to him and they would spit on his face and they would buffet him with their hands and they would beat him and they could, he could smell that fragrance of that oil. And it's just like the world when the world comes into this place and they're being beat up by the devil. And somebody takes time to love them. And somebody takes time to sit in their smoke-filled living room and teach them a home Bible study. If you're pouring that fragrance out on those people that are hurting and they're broken because somebody's kept the oil fresh. God sent me by to tell you he's, he's bringing you in, into a new dimension. And you've got to maintenance. And you've got to let stuff get out of your spirit. Take it out. Little foxes spoil the vine. Because there's healing virtue in this place. There's salvation in this place for this community. I can't let my oil get tainted because it's that fragrance that's going to help somebody pray through. It's that fragrance that's going to help somebody win victory. It's that fragrance when they come into this house uh, and they're weary and they're worn and they're broken by this world that's going to cause them uh, to not go home and pull that trigger. Because the oil's not been tainted. It's that fragrance that's going to bring them to an altar of repentance and take them into a water grave of baptism in Jesus' name. And then God's going to pour that same oil that's in you out on them and fill them with the Holy Ghost. But you've got to keep the oil fresh because my sacrifice has got to be mingled with it. Come on, I want everybody in this house to stand right now. I can't let anything hinder this oil. Because I can hear the prophet say, is there a balm in Gilead? Is there healing still left in Gilead? I can't let it get tainted. I can't get, let it get marred by the world. I can't allow my attitude and my my spirit to get wrong because there's souls hanging in the balance that are going to smell the fragrance of the Holy Ghost on you. Come on, these altars are open. I'm not going to give a fancy altar call. God, God wants to bring this place to a new dimension. Come on.